Hi guys, welcome back. We're on our second installment of this series we're going through. It is on the two verses in Ephesians, or Galatians, sorry, Galatians chapter 5 and verses 22 and 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is, there is no law. We're in our second one. We did love last week. This one is now on, on joy. This is a fruit of the Spirit, being connected to God. This is something that will come out of us, joy. And so we're going to go on a journey through a bunch of verses, looking at this concept of joy. And we want it in life, don't we? 1 John chapter 4, verse, or 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 4 says, We are writing these things that our joy may be complete. Don't we want complete joy? So we want to look at the things that are written in God's Word about joy. And we're going to start kind of in the beginning of the Bible and, and bounce around. So we're going to go to the book of Matthew, New Testament, chapter 2 and verse 10. It was one of the first times we see joy in the New Testament. And it says this, talking to the shepherds, the angels, says when... Or, when they, when they saw the star, they rejoiced. This is what the response of the, the, the shepherds was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. It's just because they saw an angel? No, it's because of the message that the angels gave. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. Talking about this too, the angel said to them, Sorry, this is the shepherds. Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. The angels were bringing some sort of good news that was going to bring joy. Joy, well, to who? All people. This is you and me and everyone that has lived. So what is this joy? Well, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3 says this, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, the sin that takes away our joy, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. God's got a plan for us. And notice what it says in verse 2, Looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's said there in that passage that it was a joy for Jesus to endure the cross. We don't think of the cross as joy, do we? But it says there, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So I believe that joy is very much connected to love and grace. In the Greek, the word of joy and the word grace are very, very similar. God's love is what gave him the joy to go to the cross because of his love for us, because of his care for us, and knowing what it would do. And so this, I believe, this joy, has something to do with the gospel and with salvation. Luke chapter 10, if you guys want to go there, Luke chapter 10 and verse 17, Jesus had sent out the 70 um, disciples and they were out there pre preaching the good news and healing each other, other people. Verse 17, Then the seventy returned, notice what they say, with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They said, hey, look at us. We've done these great things. We've got, we've got joy. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing 
shall by any means hurt you. And then he says something interesting. He says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. He says, don't rejoice in this. And then there's a word there that he says next that changes everything. It's this word, but. But rather, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So Jesus tells the disciples and the apostles and the people around him, don't rejoice in what God has has done through you necessarily. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Your salvation is with God, and that's what's most important. That's what should really bring you joy, not the circumstances here on earth. And so he says, rejoice. Your names are written in heaven. Do you rejoice that your name is written in heaven? Wow. That's what we should have joy about. Because the things here on this earth can't affect that. The circumstances and things we go through can't affect our names written in heaven if we but cling to his love. Matthew chapter 13 verses 44 to 46 has some other things connected with this about this joy. Verse 44, again, the kingdom of heaven, heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and, and hid. And notice what it says here, and for joy, go, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, I want you to notice something. Did he, he had joy before he had possession of the field. And the joy prompted him to go and buy that field. And what did it take? It take, he says, and sells all that he has. He was happy to sell all that he had because he knew he was buying something worth more. Verse 45 says something very similar. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Who, when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. It was joyful for him to go and buy that because it was valuable. And again, we see in Luke chapter 15 something else like this. Luke 15 and verse 4 says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. He has found that sheep that was lost. And when he comes home, He calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. This is a picture of Jesus, isn't it? Searching after us, and he's joyful when he finds us. Verse 7, it says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. How does heaven rejoice? It's when one sinner repents and comes to him. Verse 8 says something very similar. Or that a woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, Rejoice, this word joy, with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. We can make heaven joyful by repenting. That is powerful. This is the love of God that he's shown towards us. He's searching after us. but how do we get this joy? Well, I think there's a way we can take part in it. John chapter 15, verses 10 to 12 
says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Actually, it doesn't say that. (laughs) That's another one. (laughs) Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, sorry, you will abide in my love or live in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. And then he says, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. And then he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So God calls us, Jesus calls us to love with the same love that he has for us. He wants us to love one another with that same love. And that love, that kind of love will bring us joy because that's what it brings God. When we love like he loves, it brings joy. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3, it says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, and let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, But in lowliness of mind, let each one esteem others better than himself, than self. He says this is how we um, are complete with this joy or full of joy is being like-minded in love with him. Having the same love that Christ has for others will bring us joy, like just like it brings him joy. And so what about the trials? What about the hardships? Did Jesus have those? Did other people in the Bible have those and still have joy? There's a verse in James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. That doesn't sound fun. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. There's something here, count it all joy when you fall into trials. It does something with us. Maybe it gives us perspective. And I want to look at one passage in the book of Acts. We went through Acts in the last little while, but this was chapter 16, so it was a couple months ago. Chapter 16, verse 23 is where we're going to start. It says, when they had made, laid many stripes on them, this is Paul and Silas, They threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. This sounds like a rough time, a time not to be joyful. They were put in prison. Verse 25 has that word. That word that changes everything, but, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. Well, I would be praying too if I was in prison, but they weren't just praying. They were singing hymns to God. They were praying and singing hymns to God. Why would they do that? They had just been put in prison. They should have been saying, God, why would you do this to me? But they were singing hymns. Why were they singing hymns? Well, singing, hey, singing can boost our spirits. But they weren't the only ones there in prison. It says there that the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. And so that the foundations of the prison prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. See, he was being led by his circumstances. 
He looked around. He said, there's no way out. And so he was going to resort to killing himself. But was that really the circumstances? Verse 28 says that, but Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. This is the guy that just put him in prison. Paul could have said, hey, you're getting what you deserve and now we can walk away. But no, he says, we're here. Do no harm to yourself. You see, Paul had a heart for this man. Verse 29, then he called for a light and ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas, being in prison, they could have looked at their own situation, but they realized to count it all joy when in trials. So they started singing songs and praying, and God showed them a person to reach out to. And the person asked, what must I do to be saved? Since so, verse 31, so they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all those who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and his family were baptized. And now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before him, and he, notice what it says here, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Did you catch that? Who really had the joy here? The jailer had the joy. He rejoiced because he had found something that he didn't have before. Now, Paul and Silas, they realized that the gospel brings joy that the love of God for us brings joy and he wanted that for the jailer so he was willing to set himself aside and show him the jailer the the love of God he wasn't letting circumstances determine his joy And so you may look at your life and say, I might feel like like Paul or Silas, people are beating me. I might feel like the jailer, there's no way out. But then we realize, we realize where does joy come from? Joy comes from seeing God's love for us. And then when we've seen that love that God has for us, that that brings joy in heaven. We will want to share that love with others so they can have the same joy too. You see, joy isn't selfish. And so I challenge you this week, the, experience the joy that God has for you, which is saving you, and then share it. Take that joy and share it with someone else even amid amid trials, even amid uh, trials in maybe in jail or in shipwreck or or like we've seen before throughout God's word, that the trials, they might be hard, but they give us perspective. Let's pray. Dear God, as we go through life, it may be hard like Paul, it may be lonely, it may be impossible like the jailer but you've given us hope you're seeking after us like you did that lamb that sheep you're seeking after us like the lost coin and the pearl of great price because it is your joy to do so it was your joy to go to the cross and so i thank you for that in your name amen Hey guys, have a good week.